welcome to the NC Podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its members, clubs, for landlords and property investors to come and build profitable property portfolios that completely aligns with their goals. I am super excited this week because I have another great guest. I've got my solicitor, Nishita Gudka, on the line. Hi, Nishita. Hi, Natasha. We've been working together for the last seven years. We just discussed that just before we started this. And I'm like, wow. Um, So, Nishita, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, thanks. As Natasha said, I'm Nishita. I am a partner at Lee Bolton Monier Williams Sisters in London. I deal with all property matters. It's got to do with property. I love dealing with it. So my specialisms um, range from residential property, commercial property. I even dabble in schools and churches. Um, So the chances are, if you have something to do with property, I will probably have seen it at some point during my career. Amazing, definitely. Nishita always gives me the best advice going. (laughs) <laughs> well I, I try my best <laughs> and also honest advice when things don't seem to be panning out that way right well exactly and I'm glad you said that I think um the honesty between a solicitor and a client is probably the most important thing if you don't have that relationship of trust and confidence um you as a solicitor are not confident in telling your client when things are going to go wrong and your client is not going to be confident about listening to you when you say that so that is really really important that is so true and i know this was going to be one of the later questions but actually now we're touching on it that's one of the the biggest things that i share especially in the facebook group saying that your solicitor isn't someone who's going to be there ripping you off as some people think is will happen they have to be someone you can trust right absolutely because if we say to go ahead with a deal that we know has got um faults and pitfalls um we're the ones who are going to be giving you negligent advice it's not in our advice in our interest to do that and also the chances are if we give you bad advice you're not going to come back to us and we want you to keep coming back and building a great property portfolio and keep instructing us so true there was one fateful time over the last couple of years where i was trying to buy a property with my development partner and you said to me this lending just isn't worth it do not go for it and we pulled out Yes, I can remember that day when we had you both in the boardroom, we sat down and we'd got quite far through it and you made that really difficult decision to pull out despite the time, effort and money that you'd Mm. spent so far. And I think it was um, a good decision, but not an easy one to to make. No, but again, we're so appreciative of you for it, it was uh, for those of you listening, we had we were trying to buy a property in Nottingham, which if it had worked out, it would have been a really good deal. But we were using bridging finance. And I think, what was it? Something in, in the bridging finance terms that were just not great. Yeah, I think that you were, you were going to be liable for significant costs. Yeah. Um, the way that they had structured it and they were not willing to negotiate at all. No. And then on the day that we were looking to, or almost at the time we were looking to exchange, they changed the goalposts on how much they were lending. (laughs) Yeah. It it was, was, you know, it was a good one to talk down to experience. Definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. It's made me very wary of bridging lenders. But also it highlights the fact that bridging lenders are very much in control because they are lending unregulated finance they really can say whatever they want to and really they'll just go well you want the money so you we tell you to jump you just say how high and at that point (laughs) we couldn't find any more money we needed an extra nine grand or something that day to complete the deal yeah exactly and and they know that you're in a precarious position because you don't go to bridging finance if you have other finance sorted no exactly and and sadly i think some of them do take advantage of that 
Yes, but that deal would not have worked if we'd have gone and taken out an additional nine grand loan from somewhere else. So I'm very thankful to you to saying to stop. We'll stop the process here and we'll find another property and all will be fine. Yeah. So that being said, and I think we'll do this question first. How how do you know to choose the right solicitor then? Is it a two way process? Does the solicitor have to choose a client as well? I I think so. I think that there are some clients that I really enjoy working with because we have a good working relationship. But from a from a client perspective, um, you know, it's it is about that relationship and it is also about the knowledge that your solicitor or your legal advisor, whether they're um, a licensed conveyancer or a member of ILEX, the legal knowledge that they have. Um, and you know, one of the things I would always say is go and meet them. Go and meet the person who's given you who you are going to instruct. Do they inspire confidence? Do they, re you know, do they have enough time to return your calls? Because if they don't, when you're trying to instruct them, the chances are when you finally come to the point of instructing them, you're likely to have the same issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you'll never have a situation with a solicitor where they're so busy that they don't come back to you for a couple of days. That happens. That happens to everybody. But, you know, when you're waiting for days and days and days, that does become an issue. Um, but I think you also need to be very clear about what you want out of the relationship. Are you going to be instructing them on a long term basis? Are you going to be looking at slightly difficult transactions mm -hmm. or are you looking for a one-off very simple transaction which you know you may choose to go for somebody who can get something done quickly and cheaply so there there are a lot of factors and um, and I know we'll come to this and and cost and value which um also make a difference in in what you're going to do because the value of your transaction will dictate how much you're willing to spend on advice that's that's very true very true and I think we should co let's cover that now because uh, there's some people who say I they would never spend more than a thousand pounds on a property transaction or when they're buying or when they're selling but again you do as you said you need to weigh that up what would your advice be on that well I, I think you need to have a you need to have a, a figure in mind absolutely but work out the value of that asset to you. If you're buying a £50,000 property that is has no issues, then absolutely go for somebody who's not going to charge you a lot of money. But if you are looking at a lease where somebody actually has to read through the lease and report to you on that, factor in how long it's going to take a solicitor mm -hmm. to read the document properly and report to you on it properly. Because if you're not going to pay more than a thousand pounds, you know, if you're looking at somebody taking two to three hours just to read a lease, think how much they're going to be earning per hour out of you and whether they're actually going to be spending sufficient time on your matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 hopefully that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to try and commoditize the conveyancing process and say, we will, you know, any conveyance up to a certain amount will cost a thousand pounds. Anything over a certain amount will cost two thousand pounds. But the complexity of it really also affects the cost. And it, you know, going back to your fifty thousand pound purchase, it may be a fifty thousand um, pound piece of land that you're looking to develop. Mm -hmm. In which case, actually, the process and the due diligence exercise that your solicitor is going to have to do is going to be much more involved. And that's going to cost you more than a thousand pounds, but your your potential value once that's done properly in terms of your development will be much higher. Yes, and I think that's something that's really important to realise because I sent out uh, the final cost of how much it costs us to uh, sell Rainsborough, all fees included. So I just, I mm -hmm. put that out. Uh, I said how much we paid for your fees, how much we'd paid for getting it, uh, the property done up, how much we paid agency, all of the, the little things that ca came into play. And the one thing that people came back to me on, they were like, wow, you pay a lot for legal fees. But my gosh, that transaction. <laughs> 
was just it needed it because otherwise that would have fallen apart yes and it you know and it's interesting and it that you say that and it's it is I think a bugbear of most legal professionals that the legal fees are so disproportionate to the agency fees yeah and you know both parties have a part to play your agent will go and find you your buyer but if it falls apart at the legal stage it doesn't matter how many buyers your agent turns up with Mm -hmm. if you can't get through the legal process because it is a complicated transaction um what are you going to do (laughs) exactly and we were just in one of those situations um I think we'll talk about this as kind of a whole because I wanted to discuss with you the difference between a convencer and a solicitor. Um, And that was one of the things that came up during the flat sale that we've just done as well. Um, And I'd really not even thought about it to appreciate that there was a difference between a convencer and a solicitor, but I guess there is a difference. So could you explain that? Sure. So so, all solicitors can be conveyances. So a conveyancer is somebody who is Um, authorised to deal with a conveyancing transaction. Mm -hmm. The the difference is that a a licensed conveyancer, and when I think most people talk about a conveyancer that's not a solicitor, they mean normally a licensed conveyancer, um, is a specialist only in the conveyancing um, part of the legal world. Right. So they can... They know all about buying and selling residential properties, and there are some very, very good licensed conveyances out there. Yeah. You also have um, legal executives who are um, have the similar depth of knowledge to solicitors, but not the same breadth of knowledge as solicitors, and they are also authorised to deal with conveyancing transactions. Mm-hmm. And then you have solicitors who we have to have a certain breadth of breadth of training and a certain depth of training we have to have our two years and pass certain exams before we can be called solicitors so your solicitor will have a much broader knowledge of general legal issues Mm -hmm. and so if something comes up that is slightly out of the ordinary a solicitor is usually better equipped to raise those issues and and understand that those issues are coming up yeah okay okay so that's the difference would you pay a different cost for a conveyancer and a solicitor would there be a would there be a different cost associated with that yes you would normally expect to pay more for a solicitor than a conveyancer okay than a licensed conveyancer because you are paying for their broader um knowledge base really okay um, but, you know, a good conveyancer is probably going to charge you not far off the costs of a solicitor who is doing, you know, low value residential transactions. So it, there's swings and roundabouts. Okay. And so really, it doesn't matter what you what you're more preoccupied, what you, you really should do is, is ask someone what experience they've had previously and go with the person who would be able to get you through the deal absolutely um it it, 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 there is no point in instructing a solicitor for the sake of having a solicitor who has only ever dealt with one residential transaction in their career Mm -hmm. um then you're better off going with a good licensed conveyancer who has a number of similar types of transactions under their belt Uh, going back to, to what we said at the beginning you know it's understand understand how complicated your deal is going to be and make sure whoever you instruct knows what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. So should we move on to Rainsborough and talk about that? Now, for those of you who've been following uh, my newsletter and you've been following the podcast for a while, Rainsborough House was the property that we've just sold, but it's it was Chris, it's Chris's property, and that was part of um the block was part of a shared ownership scheme, and as part of this uh part of the transaction, for those of you that remember, I, I said that we had to pay the head leaseholder some, and then we sold on the property 
Um, so it was all under the freeholder. So it got really complicated and I did start talking about it, but I didn't do it in too much detail because at the time we just did not want to jinx that transaction. It was hard enough to get through it um, at the time. Um, so should we talk a little bit more about that and the pitfalls of shared ownership? Because that was certainly uh, one of the toughest properties to get out of ever. <laughs> Did you say? Yes, and I, it absolutely was one of the more fraught residential transactions that I have been involved in. Um, and I think going, going back, back a step, probably, you know, shared ownership on the face of it seems like a fabulous idea. It mm -hmm. gives you an opportunity to uh, um, get some equity into a property without having to have the outlay of buying the whole property. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're, you're basically, you're buying a percentage of it and paying rent to the shared ownership landlord for the balance. And you can then buy more and more of your, of your property, more shares. Yeah. Um, and in theory, it, 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 it seems like a great idea. The difficulty is, and I, and I, I think that a lot of people are not missold the idea of shared ownership, but don't fully appreciate what it means, mm -hmm. is that because you have this um, much greater involvement from your landlord, when you come to sell, they have a much greater involvement in the entire process, which, yeah. which as we learned on Rainsborough, leads to additional costs and delays. Yes. And definitely one of the biggest problems and I talked I talked about this when we first decided whether we were going to sell or keep it so to keep it it needed to be remortgaged onto a buy to let mortgage then we would have the um right to let it out but at the time when we got the problem the problem was there is that if when we were getting the new valuation done we had to go with a valuer who was of the shared ownership provider so the head lease holder and their valuer came back and at the time, I think, overvalued the property. Uh, the mortgage lender then came in and also did a uh, valuation on it. And they were, they were 70 grand apart, which I've, I mean, now looking back on it, I don't, I don't know how that happened. But um, so we couldn't ever remortgage that onto the buy to let product to get the rental property, which meant which, to get the rental to be able to rent it out so it wouldn't have ever worked which was why chris was then like like i'm gonna i'm gonna sell it and then we had to get another valuation and the clock started ticking yes and i think it's probably worth going back to the the option that you had to to rent it out yeah um the vast majority of shared ownership leases will not let you rent out land. no until you acquired the full 100%, which is why you were obtaining those valuations and re trying to remortgage. So if you are looking at a shared ownership as a buy-to-let investment, it, it doesn't work unless you buy the whole flat outright. No. And so what we what I was trying to do on Chris's behalf is because the property had gone up so much in value since he, he'd owned it, was get the remortgage and then the equity from the remortgage to pay off the um, to pay off the head leaseholder so that we could change the lease and be able to rent it out. But because the valuations were so far apart, we were never going to be able to do the remortgage and have enough equity to even be able to cover the costs that the shared ownership provider wanted for it. That was an issue. Yes, it, it, and it was, and I think that the. The, the, the one of the difficulties that you faced was, um, and, and you've said this, that when you were dealing with the remortgage, so the first thing that you were doing was trying to acquire 100% of your, of well, Chris was trying to acquire 100% with the lease. Yeah. And at that point, time starts ticking with your landlord. And um, because that didn't work out the way we wanted it to work out, yeah. um, you had to start the process in terms of selling the property. And again, then you're you're starting again from day zero again, and time 
time starts again and there is a set period of time which you have to give the property or give your um, landlord a chance to try and sell it on your behalf. And every time it doesn't work, you, you have to go through another process and another process has a minimum amount of time which you have to go through. So you can go for months without getting to the point where you want to be, which is, I just want to sell this. Yeah. So it, it, I think we got to, so the so by August, we realized we couldn't remortgage it. There wasn't enough money in it to be able to pay back uh, the, the, to get Chris out of the shared ownership scheme, let alone um, re get a buy to let mortgage because the stress test was so high, we wouldn't have been getting uh, enough of an income to do that. So then we gave notice to or Chris gave notice to the uh, provider to sell the property to sell his his shares in the property in August by October they said that it wasn't possible for them to sell the property <laughs> and that's selling Chris's share of the property so not 100% of the property. Yeah, that was 65% of the property at the time. Yeah. They the that provider came back to us um, and when I say us, by the way, I'm meaning Chris. Um, I I was literally just on the periphery helping Chris out with this. He's not a property guy at all. He really didn't want to be involved in this. And trust me, it's far too stressful for him. <laughs> He's like, it was fed up with this process by September last year. So come October, when they say they can't sell his 65% share because there's no market for it, he is steam is coming out of his ears at this point so then they couldn't sell it so then we had to get permission to put it on the open market right yes exactly which again took some time and more cost and more time incurred for me um to to go to start you with that process as well yes yeah. So, so think think about it at this stage. So, fr from around July time, we'd had to get one valuation from the shared ownership provider, which cost three three hundred pounds. We'd also had to do the remortgage process, uh, remortgage valuation as well, which had cost a little bit of money. That wasn't particularly expensive. I think less than a hundred pounds. Then uh, that didn't work, so we had to get uh, the shared ownership provider to market the property, and they did another valuation, I think, at that point, which was £300. Two months later, we'd spent money. We'd moved out of the property in September. We thought that they were going to be showing the property. They said that they had no interest whatsoever. So by all October, we're now paying £2,000 a month, roughly, for a property that's empty um, for them to say, okay, no, we're not doing it. So Nishita has been involved this whole time. Um, and so we go out to the mar we go out to the market, we put it on the market. Um, and eventually in January, we get an offer. Yes. And, and that offer was the, the, the buyer wanted to buy 100% yeah. of the share. And um, keep in mind that Chris only had 65%. So we've now got a new obstacle to overcome in making sure at completion, what the buyer is getting is not just Chris's share, but the additional 35%. Mm -hmm. And that's when, the, that's when you stepped in and took over from there. And how, how was the process for us that just went on and on and on? It, yes, and, and I think... The, the problem was the first the, the first advisor that the buyer instructed was not experienced in dealing with shared ownership mm -hmm. and was also far too busy to look at the papers that I had sent him. So by the time he'd actually clocked what was going on and what the basis of the transaction was, we were probably five, six weeks into it from having a sales memorandum agreed. Yeah. Um, in, a, in addition to dealing with the buyer, and I'm sorry if I jump around a little bit, in addition to dealing with the buyer, in order to get the consent to sell the property, we had to make an application to the um, immediate landlord to say that this is what is going on, and they wanted to have a copy of the sales memoranda 
and of, of course a copy of the valuation um, that, that Natasha and Chris had done. So that's going on in the background whilst we are dealing with the buyer and dealing with the buyer's um, advisors. Actually, I have to say, for, for dealing with that little part, the your landlord was actually pretty quick, mm -hmm. <laughs> remarkably. <laughs> remarkably. Um, we, ma we managed to get that that piece done. That piece of the jigsaw came through fairly swiftly. However, then by the time that the first advisor, Byron had instructed, had twigged what what was going on and decided that actually he wasn't able to deal with it, he then passed it to a colleague who was, I think, trying to say that on the basis that it was different advisors, albeit in the same firm, that Chris should pay the abortive legal fees, even though the transaction was not abortive. So at this point, I think Chris was getting quite frustrated that it had taken this long to get to a point where the original advisor had realised that he didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have we have the second advisor in, and he, um, to his credit, was was much better. He was um, a licensed conveyancer, but did have experience with shared ownership, and did review the papers fairly quickly and got to grips with how the transaction was proceeding, and understood the fact that Chris only had sixty five percent share. And did not have the four hundred percent to transfer, yeah, um, to his client. So we then spent quite a lot of time <laughs> trying to have a, a, a come to an arrangement which the buyer was happy with, that would ensure that at the end of the transaction he had a hundred percent share of his of the, of the flat, and. We're not, I'm still not quite sure what happened or how it happened, but he just wasn't understanding the risks involved. And in his mind, I think he believed that Chris would just sell him 65% of the property, but to take 100%, you know, the equivalent of 100% of the value. Yeah. Um, and that actually is where we found real difficulty because I was talking to your agent who was then passing on what I was saying yeah. it, you know, without giving legal advice to the buyer who then understood and was was happier and then it would go back to his advisor and he would come back and say no I'm not doing it that way and it was it was that I found the most challenge one of the most challenging parts of this transaction because the way we had structured it was risk free to the buyer but he was not being advised um well enough to allay his fears and that caused a huge amount of delay yeah and and stress i think for chris in particular yes it was it was getting and because we, it was almost like a game of chinese whispers we were hearing different things are agent great agent she was very on the ball and wanted to help as much as she could but would sometimes be relaying information that wasn't quite right or maybe she was a couple of hours behind because it was changing on an hourly basis what was happening and so that was also heightening the fears of uh, I, I guess at, at one point Chris was like I'm not doing this anymore I'll pull out of the deal even though it was not a good idea but it was just so stressful and so in the end I th what happened it was that the buyer bought the 65% off of us and then went for the 35% from the head le leaseholder? Exactly. So we structured it in such a way that it was a contract whereby the um, Chris would transfer his 65%. Um, the buyer would pay the balance directly to the um, your landlord. Mm-hmm and your landlord solicitor, and they would deal with the final memoranda of staircasing, which confirms that he's he'd now purchased 100%, and also the transfer of the head lease, which does not have the shared ownership provisions in, directly to the buyer. Yeah. But it had to be, 
everything had to be conditional on each other because from the buyer's perspective, and understandably so, he didn't want to be in a situation where he was taking the 65% from Chris without yeah. having the rest of it transferred. And from Chris's perspective, he wanted to know that this transaction was going to go ahead. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was the, the whole thing hung together by... Um, a couple of conditional co clauses in the contract, but also a number of undertakings that had to be given from the landlord solicitor via us to the buyer solicitor. Yeah. And that's, that's where complexities come in and that's where the time comes in because you are drafting the undertakings, making sure that they work. You're chasing people to give the relevant undertakings and that all takes time. And I think it would be very difficult for anybody to be able to do that sort of a transaction for anything like a thousand pounds. And go, going back to the sum that you mentioned right at the beginning, because yeah. if they are, they are just not, they are either not spending enough time on it or they are probably not doing it and somebody else much junior at a much cheaper rate is possibly doing that running around. So, you know, it, it could be possible, but I would be very surprised and I definitely would not be able to do it for that no. cost. No, and that particular transaction, as we've just been through, and uh, if you've been listening to that, thank you for sticking with us because <laughs> it was so complicated. I think all the way through it was complicated. I didn't, um, I wasn't speaking too much all the way through for those of you who remember back to that because it was just so many moving parts so much was changing and that gets me onto the the fact that looking back on it now we were spending two grand in a whole cost a month because uh chris couldn't let it out so it was vacant between um september and i think when do we when did you sell it april um may but no, end of April. End of April. So no, end. Yeah. Yeah. So almost that was nine months of hold costs at two thousand pounds per month, which was eighteen thousand pounds that uh, the pair of us spent on just keeping that property afloat plus another property. And so, whilst at the end of it, we came out on uh, of a plus, and I did. I've shown the completion statement. We did come out on a plus with this. You, we had to have the money to put into that before we started the transaction because if we didn't have, if we hadn't have had that twenty thousand pounds in our savings account, there would have been no way we'd have been able to do that deal. No way. Yeah, and I think that that raises a really um, useful point, and it applies not just to shared ownership but to any transaction. Is plan ahead. Be, be realistic about timescales. Shared ownership can be complicated and in this, you know, it can take time. And if you do not, if you do not have the money, as Natasha just said, to subsidize the property, which is what you're doing, um, do you really want, you know, can you afford to get into this sort of a transaction in the first place? You, you know, sometimes you just have no choice and you have to, to deal with what you have in front of you. But if you can, um, try and plan ahead and try and keep some money aside for these sorts of eventualities. If, if you don't spend it, great. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, fantastic. you've saved, but, you know, it, it, it's... It's it's very difficult and it's very frustrating, I think, for, for property solicitors um, where you're given a time scale that you know is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's what people have budgeted for, the unrealistic time scale. And when matters do inevitably take longer than was ever envisaged to complete, um, when you when you do what you've done, Natasha, and you've set out everything and all of the costs, I think people are shocked as to how yep. much it has actually cost them in overall. Yep. Yep. It was very expensive to get out of that. And I mean, we'd do it again. It wasn't a good investment. It, it really wasn't on reflection. But I, I think Chris came away with that and he said to me, make sure that people understand shared ownership. He said he'd never get into it again. 
Um, and re- and it is frustrating. I get it because then we paid service. He paid service charge up front, which he wasn't happy about doing. Um, and from then he's still in this conversation where he's trying to get the money back out of the head lease holder and they're pretending like they don't know about it and so it it continues it does continue um and from his point of view he's now having to make that decision of you know how far do i go to get this money back uh there there is formal complaints being made but it's it's not something that's just a done thing it's closed that's it it's completed there's been a lot of moving parts to it and so highlighting that and still that's that's something that happens when you've got a head leaseholder or a freeholder, you know, if you're a leaseholder and there's p- people above you in a transaction, that happens all the time. But you have to be aware that because other people are in the deal, you still got to deal with those people. Exactly. And, and it is not uncommon to have um, your landlord, your freeholder, not playing to the same time scales as you are. Yeah. And sometimes you need their consent before you can sell. Yeah. Sometimes you need them to give you certain information about the management of the building before your buyer will agree to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes where you have a share of the freehold, you need the other freeholders to engage with you and say, yes, of course, we'll deal with the share transfer and register the new share certificate. Mm-hmm. And you need all of those people to, to assist and as I said, they may not all be running to the same time scale as you. And that can frustrate a deal. It can delay a deal. Mm-hmm. And you just need to keep that in mind. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There are so... And it's just because you're dealing with humans. <laughs> you know, no one's, no one's all acting always on the same page that you are. I mean, we wanted it to move quickly, but other people weren't as interested in that. And that's, you know, it's kind of nature nature of the beast absolutely and unfortunately with um some types of of landlord tenant relationships the landlord has such a stranglehold on what you can and can't do with your property that they Mm -hmm. will have registered restrictions on your leasehold title so the land registry it will for example say you cannot register a sale of the property unless you have the landlord's consent. And in those situations where your landlord is not playing ball, you're stuck. There is very little that you can do that's quick and cost effective to get your landlord to play ball if they don't want to. There are remedies. There are absolutely remedies that you, mm-hmm. you can you have. But they're not quick and they're not always very cheap. No. No, definitely not. So just to wrap up, can I ask you, what? how can you make the sales or purchase process a smoother ride? So I think what you need to do is be honest about timescales mm-hmm. and speak to whoever is representing you about what is actually involved and what you want to achieve and your realistic timescales. scales. Mm-hmm which is really important, give, if you're selling, gather as much information as you have about your property as you can. So all those electrical safety certificates that you've put in a drawer somewhere, you know, the energy performance certificate, make sure that's up to date. Get your original lease if it's a leasehold transaction. Gather all of those documents and give them to your solicitor if that's who you're instructing. Mm -hmm. Be responsive and as honest as you can when they send out um, the property information form to fill in. And it may be that sometimes simply ticking the box is not going to provide enough information to your buyer. If so, there's nothing wrong with asking your solicitor to say, can you put a couple of paragraphs to go with this form? Because giving that information at the outset and giving as full a pack as you possibly can to your buyer hopefully should mean that when your buyer's representative reads to all of the papers, you have dealt with all of their concerns in one go and they can say, yeah, this is fine. I can recommend this property to my client. Yeah. If you're acting, if you're buying a property, make sure, again, you are as honest as you can be with whoever's advising you about your realistic timescales. And it may be 
if you've actually told the agent one thing that yes of course i can complete exchange in two weeks but the reality is is that your finance will not be available for six weeks mm-hmm. but be honest with your representative because there's you know um sister client privilege we don't have to tell anybody else that but we should know yeah and um, if you're if you are reliant on third party financing make sure that is in order and that's available or if you're going for bridging finance make sure you know who you're going to go for for that bridging finance um and just i think the, the key is is from first from a solicitor be as honest as you can with your solicitor because if we know what you're thinking and what your goals are we can manage the transaction yeah a lot more effectively and it may be that you want us to delay it <laughs> <laughs> which does sometimes happen um but from your perspective at least that means it's a slightly smoother ride for you it may not be so um good for for the person on the other side but our um priority is you yeah brilliant those are some fantastic tips. Thank you so much for that, Nishita. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And um, I know I always enjoy our chats, even when we're not talking about property. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm going to finish off the podcast there. But thank you, everybody, for listening to us today if you want to find out more i'm going to put links to all of the resources and contact details from anishita below make sure that you comment and you like this this podcast and subscribe because it comes out every tuesday morning and if you want to find out more about me head on over to www.ncrealestate.co.uk for more information thank you so much for joining me today i cannot wait to catch up with you again soon